Um, there we go. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our presenters today. We're so excited to have Michael Donovan and Lois Brace. Um, I'm going to start with Michael, and I'm Michael. I'm going to go ahead and spotlight you while you're speaking. Michael, as everybody probably knows, is the executive director of the Missouri Arts Council, which is the kind of arts resource organization for the state of Missouri. And he's so knowledgeable and um, wonderful to work with. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Michael Donovan. Thank you, Lisa and, and GK and, and all the others on the Extension Services team. Uh, we've been involved with arts councils forever, and we used to call them community arts agencies, and, and uh, but now we're, we're focused on arts councils, whatever brand of arts council you are. And there are about as many different types of arts councils as there are communities. Uh, and you may be thinking, is this a good time to be doing an arts, starting an arts council right in the middle of a pandemic or near the end of a pandemic? And the answer is yes, this is a good time because the communities need the arts more than ever. I think you all need the, the support and nurturing and the expression of being in the arts and having all the arts supported. I uh, thought I'd start by saying what we define as an arts council um, is basically two factors and it has to do with, with the focus and the scope. The focus should be all the arts, not just one or two arts or just um, a gallery and, and classes, although those are good things too. We support those as well. And the other is the scope, all the arts, not just picking out some arts, but supporting all the arts in all of the community. And that could be a city, it could be a county, it could be even a region. Uh, and we have all those kinds of arts councils in the state. Uh, then I'm glad to see that there's a number of groups here, some of which we already fund and some that would be new to our funding. But we do have some funding that is specifically focused on uh, arts councils. Um, small funding with an express grant that is, is a quick grant to get 30 days from deadline to decision uh, of up to $3,000 or our annual grants, which can be up to 35,000, depending on the type of arts council you are. And so we're looking at, um, and the reason we support arts councils in particular and why we support them at a higher level than, than other types of arts organizations is because they support a whole community, that they have such a huge impact on a community and the, on the impact that they would have uh, in terms of what the benefits are. We can talk a little bit about what those benefits are for being an arts council. Why do the arts benefit communities? I think a lot of us feel um, personal about what that means and how they can transform communities, but we know that they strengthen education. Arts and education uh, makes for stronger schools and stronger students, more effective students. Uh, they enliven the public areas with public art. I think most of us uh, enjoy seeing that in our communities. They attract um, uh, businesses and high quality workforce to the community. And that's important economically. They generate commerce, they attract tourism, they help support the heritage of the community uh, and help us celebrate what makes our community unique. And they promote health and healing and they're very effective for rural and smaller communities as well. And so that's why we, um, that's why we really think it's important for all communities to have an arts council. And uh, I want to be open to questions if you have questions or if you want to share your experience. And I know Lois has um, some very uh, strong, is a good example of what a good arts council is like and what they offer to the community, but I'll let her tell her story as well. Uh, some of the characteristics of a creative community, and we've been recognizing creative communities, I think 14 years now. We award a creative community every year and we've awarded communities as small as of, uh, Peculiar Missouri of a few hundred people to neighborhoods in St. Louis and Kansas City. And the thing that we find that's in common with all of these creative communities is that they're visionary, that they have a strong aspirational vision that affects and, and helps people in the community to aspire to. Uh, they help inspire innovation and creativity, even in businesses. There was a study done by the U.S. Department of Agriculture where they found, whether you're in a, a municipal area or rural area, communities that had active theater groups in the community had higher levels of innovation and creativity within their businesses. That's good for business. Uh, they're connected. Creative communities have a connection between the different sectors in the community, so across um, age groups, across races, across 
uh, ethnicities. You'll find more connectivity between the organizations and they're going to express themselves creatively. Uh, it engages citizens at a higher level. You'll see higher levels of voting and citizen engagement in creative communities. And finally, it, it supports authenticity in your community in terms about your community heritage. Uh, one of the examples I think of when I, when I think about that is the um, West Plains Arts Council and how they've developed the old time music festival and really focus on the culture that is unique to their part of the Ozarks. And that's something that's available to any type of arts council. So that's, that's what we're trying to achieve here is arts council is just one part of the capacity of a creative community. And when we think about putting together an arts council, we think about what is the vision of the community? What do we want to accomplish with an arts council? Uh, how can we promote and support the arts in the community, but also how can the arts promote and support the community itself? And that usually starts with stakeholders in the community. We'll go into a community like we're planning to do, I'm planning to do this afternoon with some people in St. Charles uh, and talk with some stakeholders, uh, whether the people in government or business or um, schools, there's lots of stakeholders that you might want to engage because they all would benefit from and have a, uh, a vision for the arts in their community and develop an idea of what the vision of an arts council could be, what would be unique about their needs in that community, what the expectations would be, and kind of create uh, what Lisa was referring to is what is the good soil for um, creating an arts council. If you garden, and I'm not a big gardener, but my wife is, and I know that she works very hard to amend the soil before she starts the season. She'll get fertilizer and worm castings and all kinds of things to build the, the soil and make it uh, more uh, vital and fertile for what you want to grow. And that's what you're doing when you're starting an arts council, is you're finding the right people, the people who can make things happen, the partnerships in the community that can help uh, strengthen your organization. We know there's a nat natural affinity, for example, between arts councils in tourism and education and um, like mainstream or business organizations like the chamber. Uh, sometimes I think of it as like a three-legged stool in a community between the arts council, tourism, um, chamber, economic development, all of these things supporting the whole community with the things each of us play off of each other. And of course, a lot of this has to do with the arts itself. You know, we want to create a thriving community that supports the arts and all the arts, whether that's a community theater or a community symphony or bringing in um, arts professionals from outside the community that you don't have within your community and looking at the resources that we have and some other organizations that we'll talk about today have in terms of supporting your ability to do that. So that's, that's really um, where, what we're talking about when we're, when we're looking at an arts council is how they work and they can all work very differently. Some of them are a independent 501c3 nonprofit. Some of them are part of their city or county governance. Uh, they may be part of a parks and recreation department, or they could be part of another civic organization. There's the Chamber, Community Betterman, uh, Missouri Main Street. And all of those have the same type of focus on all the arts and all of the community. Is anybody has any questions or you want to put a comment in the, into the chat um, box, uh, that would be fine. And if Lois, you want to chime in at any time, please do. Yeah, I liked what you said about um, the health and the healing of an arts council for its community, because I don't know who coined it, but it's a recent phrase that um, we, meaning the arts the creatives, we are the first responders to a hurting society. And I don't think there's a better time for us to see that in action than right now. And we didn't start as the natural healers in our community by any means, but through the help of our Michael twins. So I have Michael Donovan over here and Michael um, Gaines over there. Um, they helped me get started. And this was 14 years ago. I mean, I was a volunteer 
in Mexico through the theater for a number of years prior, but then um, getting started with an official art center began many, many years ago in 2007. So my first phone call was to Michael Gaines um, through um, Missouri Association of Community Arts Agencies. <laughs> That's so much words, <laughs> but um, he came. So this is important to me. I don't know how you all feel, but he showed up. He just, wham, I'm on, I'm gonna be in town tomorrow. Can I stop by? He's like, what? Oh my gosh, do I, what do I wear, you know? So he showed up and he saw what we had here. He was very encouraging. These two men, these twin Michaels that you have here are master encouragers. And he said, well, First, you need to call um, Missouri Arts Council and, you know, get get some communications rolling. But I can um, front you right now some funding when, and I didn't even know that was possible. So he was our first donation into um, Presser Arts Center at the time. It was Presser Performing Arts Center. Um, we cut that name down because it cost too much to put on the side of the building. So now it's Presser Arts Center. And through their tutelage and encouragement, we have learned so much. I mean, on my, this is the original desk, but on this drawer right here, I used to have a little piece of paper um, pinned that only I could see that said um, support bacteria because it's the only culture some people have. And that's where we live. <laughs> That's where I live now. Um, it's really difficult to give people what you want them to have. So Michael Donovan's first lesson to me was, you don't give them what they, you don't give them what you want them to have. And you don't try to teach them on what they need. You give them what they want. So that was really hard, you know, cause we as artists, we think we know more. We think we know best. And we, we want to create the community that we live in to serve. Hey, oh, it's your Lois, Lois, hang on just a second. I think we lost your voice. Oh, my. Okay. I didn't touch anything. You may have hit the key. <laughs> the, the space bar will move it. Oh, okay. I'm going to move that away. Um, Might have been the barking dog. <laughs> yeah, that. I heard that. <laughs> um, so I just, uh, I, that, that mantra still rings true today. We still cannot, we're still not at a place where we can offer to the community what we want them to have. We have not taken on the role of educator of culture. We've taken on the role of arts educators and um, through a lot of years of pain, but some glory, we've learned what the community wants and providing that to them has helped us become more appreciative of our own community. So I think um, another lesson that uh, both Michaels taught me was um, collaborations and partnerships. The more partnerships that I have engaged in with the center, the more base has grown here at the center. So we are now um, the largest multidisciplinary arts education facility in mid-Missouri, and we uh, attract 22 zip codes of participation. And so that makes us a regional arts center, not a Mexico arts center. In fact, some of our own Mexican Coens, as they like to be called, they are not aware of what we do or where we are. Uh, it's our region, it's our rural region and our partnership now that's our biggest partnership is with Mid Met Missouri Military Academy and we provide all of their arts education um, to their cadets. So they bus them here every day and we provide instruction for all of those courses. And that's become a real solid foundation. That has put us in the minds of people internationally because they attract 200 um, cadets from all over the world. So just having the, the more generosity of heart 
that these two men have taught me to have has created very unique possibilities for us. And the generosity of heart that I'm speaking of is again, that, um, that mentality of sharing. And I think coming out of the community theater here in our town, it was more about, you know, this is mine and this is ours. And I don't want anybody telling us how to run it. I don't want anybody um, coming in and taking it away from us. And that was completely silly. I mean, I look back on that now and it's like, we lost so much time with that mentality. Now it's grown into something that we're sharing with other um, theaters in the state and hopefully outside of our state with um, competitions through the American um, Theater Association. So American Community Theater Association, excuse me. But uh, yeah, we've been here 14 years and we've grown up a culture. So we started very small with children's programming, with a dance program, piano, voice, summer camps, after school programs. And now we're at the point where those kids that grew up with this are bringing their babies here for three-year-old ballet and participating in auditions for all the summer camp shows and the main stage productions. So we serve our community and we have a lot of out-of-staters and out-of-towners that come in. We do, um, we don't provide housing for our camps, but we have set up certain host families that we put them in touch with. And then that's, that's not part of what we provide but they keep coming back. Um, and Megan, who's here somewhere, I can't see you, Megan, but um, she's one of our participants and she's been a leader in that. And um, she can probably talk on it too, but yeah, we, we've enjoyed some, some great uh, moments here, even through COVID. So COVID has been kind to us. I don't think that's the story for everyone but um, we've grown to capacity through COVID. We became Missouri Art Safe certified through COVID, which we'd never considered before. Um, we received CARES funding and PPP, and it's, um, it hasn't hurt us in a, in a horribly financial way where I understand others have been hurting from, but that's my story. I don't know what else I can talk about, but I can answer questions. <laughs> you you have some strong um, support and connections with the teachers in your community too. Yes, yes. And I think not every community does that, but I think that's a key uh, strategy. One of the events we host every year is called the Arts Summit. And it started out of a picnic table conversation with two teachers at a summer camp waiting to pick up their children. And they were bashing on the school system severely that they are forced to attend these professional development days that have nothing to do with their field. They were music, art, and theater teachers. And I said, you, you mean they make you go to professional development for um, math and and yeah, the whole center, the whole focus was on athletics and how to get athletics more exposure and how to do um, the STEM in the athletic program. And rah, rah, yeah, they're the, you know how teachers can be. So I said, well, why don't we host a professional development day just for the fine arts? And, and they said, yeah, 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 that'd be great. And I did it and got some people from Desi to be here to guest speak. They did not know what they were in for because <laughs> these were all, they all showed up. They came and they um, had a lot to say. So we had a activity plan for them. Oh, 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 and, and we put them on the stage. We put all of the tables and chairs and round tables on the stage and spotlighted them and said, you are the stars for the day. And we gave them beautiful, hot lunch, not a boxed lunch, you know, and that was all um, catered in by our board of directors who did it for free and didn't cost us anything. 
And then Desi didn't cost us anything. They came as guest speakers. Michael offered um, a, a grant that was a match for that. And they loved it. And they learned a lot about what each other does in their own disciplines. So what I did not understand were those teachers didn't have time to talk or communicate with each other about the programming. And through the Art Summit, they were able to develop some things regionally because we attracted 17 different school districts in our region. And they started um, saying, well, hey, what if we did this book? And then we could do a whole, so they, I think they did Anne of Green Gables. They chose a book for the following fall and all the school districts did Anne of Green Gables reading. They did Anne of Green Gables um, artwork. They did um, cuttings from it. They did um, videos and they sent them to each other and the, each school shared that. It was, it took off like wildfire. So we have that too. And we also have a, a partnering program that's similar to that called um, Arts and Aging. And it's a conference for arts and aging adults during the day. We call them our daylighters. Because what I discovered were, was our people, I don't know about your guys, but our people don't like the word aging and they don't like the word senior. So they're the people that are available during the daylight hours which some of our other folks are not, they're working. And some, we do have some stay-at-home moms and um, people that are not of mature age, but there are daylighters and they participate in a conference every year for that, that kind of shifted from the art summit to provide for another group of people in our communities. See, this is so critical. You know, Lois does this very under, kind of low key, but if you get your teachers involved and engaged in the arts, if you don't learn to appreciate arts as a child, you never learn to appreciate arts as an adult. And if you get the children to come, their parents will come too. And so yeah. Lois did what Lois does. She meets people where they are. You're a teacher, you got, you got needs, she resolved that. If you're a person who doesn't want to be called a senior or aging, she's got a program for you too. She'll meet you where you are. And I think that's that's a lesson we can all learn from is to just beat people where they are. Art doesn't have to be so highbrow that people can't reach up to it. And we have arts in every community. I mean, there are people doing the arts, writing things, taking photographs, creating things, doing crafts and paintings and things everywhere. There isn't a place that lacks the arts, but there are lots of places that lack support for the arts. And that's where the arts councils make a difference. In the schools, in the streets, in the city, wherever. I wish you could see the place that Lois has built. I mean, when I first saw it, it was a nice place. It had a stage, it had, you know, all the things that you'd expect to find. The building was old and it, it needed some things. And she raised a lot of money in a small town and made it happen. It's, it's really inspiring to see what you built there, Lois. Well, thank you. Uh, and know that it could happen anywhere where people had to drive in, in place. You know, like, so it's not a big city, it's not a big market, but it's got an amazing performing arts center. I discovered a term about a year or two ago called micropolitan communities. And I laughed and thought, oh, I'm gonna steal that one, that's so fun. And then I looked it up and it's legit. That's a real word <laughs> that was developed through community um, recreation, I believe. But it's a legitimate term for communities that are 15,000 and below in population that offer amenities that rival metropolitan areas. And you probably are in one, you're probably a micropolitan community that can offer so many things. So when I wrote down all of the amenities our communities in our area offer, yes, it's true. We rival any metropolitan area. You know, we may not have a Starbucks, but we have a coffee shop that's probably better than Starbucks. And it's, um, it's uplifting. The arts truly do uplift your people and your community. And 
you know, we've had um, some shutdown and some closures and some very limited numbers coming in. And we had a dance, um, end of the year dance party yesterday. And one of the parents came in for the first time. And, you know, they, we hear this almost once a week now since April. Oh my gosh, I've missed this place so much. Thank you, thank you for opening. And they can't wait to participate again. And our numbers are high for summer. They weren't as high as they were in 2020, but I don't, I don't look for that to last long, but they're, they're doable. We had one production um, end of April, limited seating. We had protocols in place and sold out every night, which you would think, oh, well, of course, limited seating, right? But no, this was not a popular show. It was Hank Williams' Lost Highway. That's not a popular title. Nobody knew what it was. They came anyway because they just missed being here. They missed the arts. And I think um, taking a cue from my Michael twins, you know, they're master encouragers. So if you can mirror that encouragement to your community through the arts, through all of the programs, first and foremost, through your teachers that you hire, the people that you put in front of your people, if they can be happy and encouraging, that's really what a lot of people are looking for is acceptance and encouragement and, you know, that um, health and healing, you know, making sure that they're being fed nutritious um, emotions through the arts. I think that's really a key important part of the teaching and who we hire for teachers here. Lois, I have a quick question. Can you tell us about um, stumbling blocks that you may have had? Like what lessons could we learn through the process? Oh yeah. Because <laughs> I know you a lot, learning through failure is usually a great lesson to help other yeah. people. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, if, if you're run by a board and most 501c3s are board ran, you know, these are the, the, the white little lies we tell each other. And this is the big elephant in the room, but um, you asked the question. So I'm going to tell you the truth. It's a board member here or there. You know, one person that has a personal agenda, they don't fit well. So in choosing board members, it's real important for me as an executive director to have input on those choices. And as much as I want my board to run like a legitimate board of directors, you know, I also want them to consider uh, my input because I'm here every day and they're not. And I see who walks through the doors and I know who's calling on the phones and I know who's making donations and I know who's causing trouble, you know, by stirring up um, controversy and conflict, strife. So, that is not an ideal board member. And, you know, it's been occasionally that we get one of those on the board anyway, regardless of how I felt or what I said. And they're difficult to work with. They make your job, they steal the joy from your job. They steal the life from your creativity at times. So I'm not gonna bash terribly on the board member um, we've had maybe three through my 14 years that I couldn't wait to see let go, you know, the, waiting for their term to end. I'm sure you all have had that experience um, as well. But um, yeah, board members. And then, of course, there's always the money. Um, I have a couple of um, uh, relationships with people that they won't pay for everything. You know, they, I can't go to them with anything to ask for support. The word support means money. You know, there's other kinds of support. Yes, I know. But when somebody wants to schedule an appointment with me to talk about how Presser can support them, it's always about money. <laughs> and I always say, well, we're a nonprofit. We receive money. We don't give money. <laughs> Best line ever. You're a nonprofit. You, you, you receive donations. You never give them. So, my donors, which I guard, you know, with my life because they're so precious to us, um, 
there's three that I can call at any time and say, oh my gosh, our laptop burned, you know, it's dead. Is there any way you could see it clear to help us? And, you know, immediately I'm getting a check in the mail to cover the cost. Well, how much would that be? I have one that's awesome. It's like, well, they're like $1,500 for a nice Apple, you know, pro. And the next day I might get a check for two grand. That, those are miracles. And that doesn't happen often, but I guard those um, very uh, uh, cautiously by not utilizing that too often. That's not a stumbling block, but money in general is a stumbling block, not knowing how much to budget for something. Also, I come from a very rural area, and so we get a lot of phone calls about, hey, I, I saw this show on my cruise, and I'd like to see that here, so can we bring them here? And, you know, it, it'd be easy to just roll your eyes and laugh and go, oh, yeah, right, but to come from a place of yes first has bought us, um, bought me uh, relationships, has paid for a footing and a foundation for a relationship with someone. Because what they're asking is ridiculous. You know, we're not going to fork out 30 grand for a cruise show that you saw in the Bahamas. But let's talk about that. You know, let, let, well, tell me who that was. Let me write that down. Let me do some research. Let me get back with you. Let me follow up with that. I, you know, I've heard of the show that they're doing right now in Arrow Rock. Would you like to go see that together? And, uh, let's, look, and let's evaluate that. And, you know, it's bought us some... Um, some uh, pleasantries with our community members that would have normally never walked through our doors to come from a place of yes first. And then kind of guiding them along the path of this is eventually going to be a no, but I want you to discover it on your own. <laughs> You're kind of just leading them to the no that they've asked for. Um, other stumbling blocks is maintenance and overhead. You know, our, our build, one part of our building is 100 years old and the other part is three years old. They've been married. And so now, you know, we're hoping for offspring, but I don't know if that's gonna happen anytime soon, but they're together and keeping the maintenance going. And, you know, we need money for this one production that I've already got 27 people signed up for. Um, but here's the same amount of money that's needed to replace the hot water heater. So what do you do and how do you make that decision and how do you jumble up your um, finances? Um, right now, my biggest stumbling block is um, hiring some additional faculty. And I had no idea that tech, teaching technical directors were such unicorns, they're, they're practically non-existent. <laughs> So that's my current stumbling block is trying to find someone to fit a need that we have and we're paying them well. So if you know anybody, pass it on. I think I, I, we may want to open this up to questions. Thank you so much, Michael and Lois. I'm going to put it back in gallery view now. And if anybody has any questions they want to put up in the chat or if you would like to um, raise your hand, I'll try to see if I can then. Uh, See you there. There's a question coming in from Bob. Where does the funding for paying the teachers come from? For, um, for us, it's um, we have an annual budget that we budget for, and we are most people would think, and some of our board members um, sometimes forget that we are not funded by the programs we offer. We are practically breaking even on our programming. We have a couple of events that do very, very well. And that's our summer camps and our main stage production in December. It's always a blockbuster. So off of one show in December, we might clear $35,000. And in the summer, we're doing forty to $50,000. That was in 2019, <laughs> probably not this year. So that's like our bread and butter. That's our nutcracker. Um, the rest of our funding is from donations. 
memberships and grants. We do a lot of grant writing. Missouri Arts Council is very kind. Um, we have several foundations that are local and we are constantly on the prowl for, you know, those whales that are out there that are relational donors. So most of our funding, I'd say 70%, um, if not 75% of our funding is through fundraising, donations and grants. Thank you, Lois. Michael, I don't know if you wanna add anything on to that. Or... Can't hear you. I can't oh. hear you, Lisa. Can't oh, you hear me? Okay. There you are. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. Uh, I was just saying thank you, Lois. And uh, Michael, I don't know if you wanted to add anything on to that or say anything additional to that. Well, in terms of funding, uh, sure. we think, yeah, we do We do have a funding um, uh, dedicated for arts councils, a small express grant for up to $3,000 that it takes 30 days to, to get, and um, or an annual grant up to $35,000. Um, and uh, those, are, those are grants that we prioritize. We think those are important. Um, all of our grants are a matching grant. That means you have to match our, our amount that you get and you have to spend it in the match and get reimbursed for the money, which can be a problem for some smaller groups who don't have the cash flow naturally that uh, a larger group would have. I also wanna point out with that a question is that I heard from um, Sue Greenberg at Volunteer Lawyers and Council of the Arts. And she wanted me to remind people that if they're looking to start an organization, they provide legal and accounting assistance uh, for those organizations that are Columbia and East and Volunteer Lawyers and Council of the Arts in Kansas City would provide that support at no cost. If you're looking to incorporate as a nonprofit or get your nonprofit status, set up bookkeeping systems, um, to also advise on fiscal sponsorship agreements. What's the name of the uh, Kansas City group? Yeah, Kansas City Volunteer Lawyers and Accounts for the Arts. That's kcblaa.org is their website. kcblaa.org is the, the website for Kansas City. And for St. Louis, it's just blaa.org. Volunteer Lawyers and Accounts for the Arts. And they also, St. Louis in particular, has some resources on their website. Uh, that you can just learn from about different legal issues. I see a question here from Bob that says, do you have a dedicated grant writer fundraiser employed? And that answer is no. I have, we have three full-time employees, well, two currently, full-time employees, one part-time employee. I'm looking for a third time, third full-time employee. And then we have a menagerie of contract employees, but um, my administrator and myself, we do all the grant writing. And then we have a fundraising committee for the, from the board and they take care of fundraising. Our grants don't require that you have a professional fundraiser. We ask you the questions that you would have the answers to mm -hmm. and just write clearly and fully and, and that would be sufficient. So Michael, um, if people out there who are thinking about starting an arts council or an arts center, what are some things that they need to kind of check off or things that they need to think about, maybe the top five things before they go forward and contact lawyers to the arts? You know, what are some ducks they need to get in a row? Well, I think even before you, you go to volunteer lawyers, um, you really want to get a group of people in the community together who really feel strongly about making this happen. And the thing that the, the um, the, ch the challenge for a lot of groups is that they get people outside the arts. You'll very quickly get people in the arts who are interested in seeing arts council happen, but it's not gonna work community-wide unless you get stakeholders from all sectors of the community. So that's why we're gonna to talk to the stakeholders and governments first, but we'll also talk to people in education because we know education is important, um, uh, parks and recreation, schools, school superintendent, uh, in fact, I have a whole list that I can send. It's just a generic list of the types of people in every community that you really want to have um, talk to and get involved in and make sure that we make, you create an organization that has community support and also supports the community. Businesses, for example. I'm sure we'd love to see that list, Michael. We could okay, send that I'll out. I'll send that to, to you guys and then you can share it. 
Sure. Thanks. Tony or Tori, I'm sorry, did you have a question? I did. Thank you. Um, Michael, do you the grants that you guys offer, do you have to be incorporated as a 501c3 or fiscally sponsored in that way in order to apply? What are the restrictions on the application on the applicants? The form you do the have form? you do have to be a eligible organization, which means you've either already got your 501c3 or your city or county governance. Um, it, you, you, they can do it on behalf of the community. Um, social service agencies, other nonprofit organizations, it doesn't have to be an arts organization. And it can be a team but, as well, Tori, as we, I know that your, your format is through a chamber, which is also okay, Michael, correct? Yeah, that's a C6, so, so a C6 could apply? I, let me double check that. I think things have changed, but generally speaking, yeah, we will, some chambers have a educational component that they, they can use. Um, yeah. For, for, for applying. Um, I know at one forum I went to early on, they were saying one way around would be to, you know, part, I mean, we already have active partnerships with the city and with, you know, I, I work at the library, for example. So perhaps we could just well, the library the application could through them, right? Yeah. And have it fund, fund us. But uh, I was just wondering, yeah, if, a C, if you could find out if a C6 could apply directly, that would be great. They are a different tax thing, but thank you for that. Um, they are. So would this be for funding for programming or funding for, um, we wouldn't fund, for example, to start the organization? That no, yeah, not. no, not not for administrative or technical support right. for, for programming or, I mean, at the moment, we don't have anything we're, right. we're desperately seeking funding, but I'm just curious. So somebody had asked me recently, what was the best kind of programming to start? What's the easy thing to, to start with? And we have a touring program of performing artists of different types. And that's a very turnkey program. In other words, we'll pay for 60% of the artist fee. And that would include their per diem and travel and everything related to us. And they can help you promote it. And they come in and they do their, their program. If you've got and, the and is that the one that pays for even some bus travel and things like that to the, I feel like I listened to something about that before. That you well, if you're thinking for. we've got we've got a grant for what we call Big Yellow School Bus, and that's the pay for students to go to an arts program. Gotcha. So that's a separate program that's only open to schools. Okay. But that's where your relationship with the schools is important. When you're as an arts council, you're not always raising money or doing programs for yourself. You want to support things throughout your community too, and that may mean helping promote these opportunities to schools so that they have the chance to be funded and go to the arts. And does your pot of funding only apply to programming or could it go to projects like uh, uh, public murals and things like that? It can go to projects. Um, it can go to services. It can go to promotions. Say you're an arts council and you want to do uh, uh, email every month for all the arts that happen in your community to your mm -hmm. list. It can go to support that. Oh, wonderful. So it's not just about programs, services too. We've got some arts councils who are primarily services because their community has enough organizations to do the programs. Or you may have a community that doesn't and the need is for you to provide the programs too. And it depends on your community. But we Excellent. can find them. Well, thank you so much. That's very helpful. Thanks to both of the Michaels. <laughs> I, you know, Michael, you said something really important there. And by the way, I'm trying to kind of summarize the notes in the chat. So feel free to save the chat. I'm trying to kind of take notes and make uh, important note of, um, markers here. Michael, you said as an arts council, it's not necessarily always doing fundraising and promoting for yourself. It's important to promote, promote other things in the community as well. I think that's such an important point and that speaks to what fundamentally an arts council is when you talked about focus and scope and things like that. that the really arts council is a civic organization. It's a civic service organization. You're not in competition with the arts that are happening in your community. The more arts that happen in your community, the more successful the community will be and the more you're helping leverage the community. So I've, I've heard of some organizations that say, well, we don't want to do that because that, that's their thing. No, you're there to promote all the arts and support all the arts, the arts that you're doing, the arts that other people are doing, because that's how the community grows. And I've also told groups that the more grants that are that are applied from within the community by others, the more money they can go in the community. We can only give an individual applicant so much, so many grants, one or two at the most. 
So your role is to help the community find ways to develop its own infrastructure and support for the arts with you promoting and coordinating that. And when you when you go into those kind of programs, there's like balances. There's no model for what an arts council is, but some are program based and some are services based. Some are combinations of both. So, for instance, with the Hannibal Arts Council, we we have a professional theater in town. We don't see them as competition. We see them as adding to the community. And yeah, we're promoting what they're doing. We have a, an artist guild, the Hannibal Art Club. We do things in partnership with them and we support them and they meet at our building and we do whatever we can uh, for them. And we have a concert association who does a presenting uh, series, but they're doing large scale. Maybe we do lower scale with like a hundred people or less in our gallery uh, or in a church or wherever in the community. Uh, so yeah, it's all part of the arts community, the arts culture. And we, we see ourselves as kind of, we're not an official umbrella for any of them. They're all separate, but we, we have to work together, especially in small towns. That's, that's such an important point. I really appreciate you pointing that out. I and also again, think to that note, sorry, Lisa, to interrupt. Um, I think we're working regionally is important too, because maybe there you could have a regional arts council in some situations like the Washington Arts Council or the, I think it's the Four Rivers, correct, Lisa? Mm -hmm. Arts Council. And so they yes. take a regional approach um, and that just works great as well. So I just want to add on to Michael Gaines's point. Sure, we have, we have board members from four different communities in our area, even though we're, we haven't said Hannibal Area Arts Council or anything, but we do, even from, El, we have board members from Illinois, just across the river. So we see ourselves as, yeah, regardless of the title, I guess, we're not going to go through a change in our name yet, but, but <laughs> you can't. Because we've got Canton, like Carol Matheson here on the call. Um, they have an arts council that's just, just north of us. And just south of us, there's a Rain Tree Arts Council, which is Louisiana and Clarksville. So there's kind of a, a break. So we have, arts, we have arts representatives from Quincy, Illinois, Hannibal, Palmyra, Monroe City involved in our organization. So don't just think within your city limits as well to be that limited. You can go outside. Thank you, Michael. There is a question that was um, kind of put into a private message here, and, I, and I'll just ask it because it may represent some of the people here. So there's an, or, there's an organization um, like a museum, for example, that has a multidisciplinary art and cultural focus. They were wondering, Michael Donovan, if that would fit the category for funding. They, they, technically, they typically apply through regular program support but they're wondering after hearing you talk about this, if they might think about applying for this arts council support. I think it's something we would be glad to talk to them about and find the best place. For many of our programs, there's more than one place that you can get funding. Although we'll only give you funding from one place for any one program, but uh, they may fit into arts councils and I'd be glad to talk to them about that. And I, I have been putting up the website for Missouri Arts Council. There's several, you know, there's a grant section, there's um, what we do section. There's a lot of different things that Missouri Arts Council does. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage you to browse through that Missouri Arts Council website and I can put up that web link again. Um, let's see, there's another comment that came in. Sorry, I'm trying to scroll down here. Yeah, well, just really quickly, like, Tori, sure. when, when I come down to Nixa so next month, we can, we can, I think I try to keep up on what Missouri Arts Council is doing. I can also address some of these as well. And like Carol and I were having lunch next week. So we can, we can talk right. a little bit more about that. And then Dory, I think I'm scheduled to come to Platte City in May or have a Zoom call with you guys. So we can talk more at length about what and carry on what Lois and Michael have been talking about as well. That's great. Yeah, through the library, I did one of the Arts Council trainings, just seeing what kinds of things we might be able to get through there uh, a couple of years ago that they offered regionally, you know, in Springfield. And it was very useful. That's why I vaguely remembered the bus and some other things. But our Arts Council hadn't kind of settled it in its uh, in its home yet in terms of how we were going to form. So um, thanks for entertaining those questions. And yeah, uh, Michael reached out to reached out to our current president. We've only been around for a little over a year. 
and we've only had bylaws and stuff since last summer during the pandemic. So um, thanks for proactively reaching out. He, he kind of uh, came to our meeting briefly to give an overview yesterday and um, we're just really excited about having the support. So. Sure, that's what we're there for. Any one of us, Lois, Michael, Michael, Lisa, GK, we were, you know, you're part of a, a network uh, and getting plugged in for the first time into, you know, things like this, to, you know, keep it up. It's good. Um, and, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Michael. I was going to say very quickly, I would also encourage communities to not feel like they just need to support nonprofit arts, especially in a small community. A lot of your, your art and performances in particular take place in commercial venue. Uh, churches and bars alike, and uh, and it's all part of the arts, and so is what people are doing individually. Their avocational art matters too. Uh, one of the differences that I would consider between a metropolitan community and a micropolitan community is that in a metropolitan community where I mostly live, I can go to a world-class symphony in St. Louis, but if I want to be in performance symphony, I'm better off in a smaller community, and that matters, I think. Yeah. Lisa, you're muted again, I think. Oh, I apologize. I, I just said, thank you, Michael. And I added that note into the chat. Um, we're coming up to the one o'clock hour here, but there are a couple notes I just wanna point out. Um, Jenny uh, was talking about the Poetry Out Loud uh, program is a great high school arts program. Michael Gaines and Jenny Sanders worked with that program. Nixa High School participated this year and she put her email there. And then Carol Matheson, pointed out also that sometimes arts councils work together too. Um, she and uh, Hannibal just did a really successful plein air um, weekend. And that's an example of different arts councils working together. So, um, okay, any, any other questions, last minute questions here? We are kind of coming up to the hour if you need to leave. Um, so I don't have too much time, but if you have any last minute thoughts or questions, feel free to put them in the chat or ask them now. Um, Bob says the annual MACA conferences are great opportunities for learning and networking. Yes, they are. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Michael, if uh, we can put the MACA website up there too. Um, yes, that would, that would be great. Okay, we can put that up there. One thing, one thing I'd point out to everyone, because I know everyone on this call is, is working in some way in the arts. And I'm just kind of like be the person that after like 28 years in the same position uh, to, to keep that passion about community. And sometimes after so long, or even if you're newbies, uh, to step back and really realize what your leadership has the potential to do in your community and, or, or a state or within your organization that like, it's hard in the trenches Sometimes you get overwhelmed, but I think it's it's great that we can, you just got to remember why we're doing what we're doing. And it's for our community and it's for our neighbors and it's for our friends. And I've had to, the last year, really step back and just re, revisit that passion and what fire really, really started it all. Uh, so, so keep up the good work in your communities is all I yeah, encourage you to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That's an important note. Um, Jory was asking, what's the date of the MACA conference? Is it in person? And I think GK is, or I'll, I'll put that into the website, but Michael, if you know that information, be helpful it'll, to it'll be next. It'll be next April. Uh, we're going to do a series of professional development workshops coming up and just social hours for people that work in community arts, just to once a month have an hour, just to kind of chat like this, but less maybe less structure, but also we have two professional development opportunities coming up for um, one talking about um, inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility in the arts, specifically for rural communities. Uh, and the other one's gonna be on fundraising. Great. So those will be coming up soon. Okay. And I just, I just put the website up for MACA there. Yeah, yeah, and anybody doesn't get our emails, just send me, same way with Michael, uh, Missouri Arts Council, you know, you can connect with them uh, through an email um, alert, uh, MACA is the same way. So go to the Great. website, find my email, send me an email. Well, we wanna thank everybody. I, I wanted to let you know that this webinar series, that we this was very helpful today, and we hope this is just the beginning 
of a conversation. And we hope we've provided some resources, whether it's an opportunity for funding or maybe just, oh, I didn't know that or a new term. We hope that we've um, helped provide some education around what an arts council is and why it's important. Wanted to let you know that we at Extension Community Arts will be having another of these webinars. Our next one will be uh, June uh, 3rd, and it's gonna be all about fiscal sponsorships. And we have a couple of members from the Midwest Artist Project Services here in St. Louis who have a huge fiscal sponsorship program. Um, we have other people who have taken advantage of fiscal sponsorships can talk about that experience. So if that's an aspect of arts planning that you're interested in, stay tuned for more information about that. And of course, Michael Donovan at Missouri Arts Council, um, they can provide you some information about fiscal sponsorship as well. Um, and we, then we will continue in July with the Build Your Board information that Extension offers which is not just for the arts, but it's, it's a great um, educational kind of curriculum that can help you build your board if you're interested in doing that. So we have some events coming up. Um, please take advantage of these resources. Again, this has been recorded, so we will provide this. We'll put this up on our MU Extension Community Arts YouTube page, and we will follow up with the survey. And Lois and Michael Donovan, Lois Brace and Michael Donovan, thank you so much for your expertise and for your wisdom. We really appreciate it. It was wonderful to get to know what you do a little bit better. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thanks everybody. Have a great day and we'll follow up with you. Take care. Bye-bye.